Welcome to Her Legal Global. Today we're welcoming Stacy Calamaris, who is here to talk to us about her course, Trade Markabilities. This is a turnkey solution for lawyers who want to practice in the U.S. in the trademark area. Stacy is a seasoned pro. She is a trademark attorney who has represented some of the world's most well-known brands in more than 150 countries. She started her career as a marketing and advertising executive working for multinational corporations before attending law school in her mid-30s. As a lawyer, she spent the bulk of her career working in big law, assisting companies of all sizes from startups to multinational corporations to identify register and protect their brands in the US and abroad. She is the founding partner of Calamaris Law Office LLC, an intellectual property boutique providing trademark, copyright and advertising legal services to startups and emerging businesses. Stacy has been recognized by her peers as a super lawyer for her outstanding knowledge and services in intellectual property law. In the past three years, she has educated more than 3,000 lawyers on four continents on various trademark topics. So welcome, Stacey. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much, Faye, for having me. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful. And I just want to tell everybody a little bit about trademark abilities, because to me, it just seems like the most amazing course ever. I would have been thrilled to have this type of product if I was starting out in this area. It's a complete turnkey solution. And what I mean by that is when you go through this course, you get everything. You get all of Stacy's wonderful, amazing wisdom in terms of what pitfalls to avoid, how to streamline your process, how to know what to do with all the different forms. In fact, you get the forms. So it's really an amazing, amazing course. And I want to ask you, before we delve into a little bit more about talking about trademark abilities, what got you into creating this course? Why were you so passionate about it? So it's a really good question and thank you for, for those kind words. So, um, you know, I started my career, I was a first year lawyer in my late thirties. Um, I started my career in big law and I was really fortunate because I worked with some amazing partners um, who helped me, helped guide me and helped, um, helped educate me about the trademark process. And I was fortunate because I was working in big law. So I worked on some really large portfolios. And the advantage there is you get to see some really interesting issues. Um, large companies, you know, tend to have a lot of money to spend and they're, you know, protecting their brands, they're defending their brands, they're doing some interesting things. So I was exposed to a lot of interesting issues as a, as a very young attorney. Um, I lost my job at the, at the height of the recession uh, in 2009. And um, I already had a number of clients of my own and some people around me encouraged me to form my own firm. And it was then that I realized that it was really scary. I was still a young attorney. I was um, about three and a half years out of law school. And um, to lose that safety net, that mentorship of those around me was frightening to me. Um, I started my practice in DC. I'm born and raised in Chicago. And when I came home and started, you know, networking and talking with people, I remember people said to me, well, you need to do real estate law. You need to do family law. You need to go to traffic court. And I thought, well, <laughs> why in the world, first of all, would I do any of those things? Like I, I've been a branding person my whole life. Um, and how in the world would I ever learn those things on my own? And I think it was then when I first realized how difficult it is for solo and small firm practitioners to really learn anything and to exist. I'll admit, right, up until, up until that time, being a big law attorney, I, I didn't really think much about it. I had all of these resources around me, um, you know, I, I had all of, I had a, a law library, I had all of these online resources that I just took for granted. And so it was then that I realized how really difficult, honestly, it must be to be a solo and small firm practitioner. And what in the world would I had done? What, what, what would I have done if I would have started my career at the height of the recession? And I didn't know anything. I mean, at least I knew something and I could move forward with my clients and developing my clients. And thankfully I had wonderful colleagues to bounce things off of. Um, 
I, I struggled throughout the recession. I mean, I did whatever I needed to do to advance my career. I did uh, eventually fold that first iteration of, of my farm. It was the first iteration of Calamaris Law Office. And I went back to big law in 2014. Um, and it was then, honestly, that the very first idea for a trademark academy of some kind was developed because I realized that the formal training that I had received as a young associate didn't exist anymore in big law. We can discuss all the reasons for that. There were a lot of reasons and how big law had sort of moved on and, and, and the reasons for that and, and partners just not having as much time. But I realized that mid-level associates didn't know the basics. And that really um, bothered me and it, it, it affected me profoundly. Um, and I, I, clients, no matter who they are, whether they're large institutional clients or small clients from Main Street, they deserve to have quality protection. In, in the United States, um, and, and I think people who don't practice in this area all the time may, may be surprised to, to know this either one way or the other, but most of our um, neighbors, Canada included, require a competency test for lawyers to file trademarks. It, it, much like our patent bar here in the US, you have to study, you have to pass another test to be qualified to represent clients in trademark matters. We don't require that here in the United States. And that's troubling to me. Um, so Canada requires it, Japan requires it, Argentina requires it, I believe Australia requires it. We don't require it. If you pass the bar, no matter who you are, you can represent clients um, in trademark matters. Um, I don't think that that's right personally, because I think trademarks are incredibly valuable. If you look at how, how trademarks um, add value to a brand, if you understand the business of trademarks, um, it, it shouldn't be so. It's and very I, valuable. So yeah. let's just talk a little bit about how, well, more like, let's talk about why would you want to practice? You're, you're getting into a little bit of that with, you know, the value of the brand, but yeah. what can you do? Like, why would you want to go into this area? To me, it sounds very interesting. It's related yeah. to business. It, it yeah. has a lot to do with, you know, the business development and how yeah. these, these companies are memorable. So tell us a little bit about why would you want to go into trademark law? People tend, you know, I, I meet I meet law students and, and young attorneys. All people are really drawn to IP. I think for those reasons, right? It seems really fun, right? There's lots of cool things that are done on the business end, you know, commercials and all sorts of interesting things. So I think either you're drawn to it or you're not. But from a business kind of legal perspective, trademark and and other IP areas are are, are great because they're they're federal practice areas. So you can be barred in in one jurisdiction and you can represent clients, you know, no matter where they are. I have a lot of clients from overseas. It's just, it's a very interesting kind of diverse practice area. There's very few industries that I don't work in. I personally choose not to represent clients in a handful of industries. That's a personal choice that, that, that I make. Um, and I'm partial to certain industries just because of my business background, but it's a very kind of fun and, and lively um, industry. Uh, my, my mom lives in a, in a nursing home now, but when I first came home, uh, when I lost my job, I lived with her for a number of years. And it's very exciting when a commercial comes on TV that you've cleared the mark for. Uh, you feel like you've played a role in that. And, you know, I had those feelings more so when I worked on the business side of building brands. But even as a lawyer, some of the brands that I've worked on, you see a commercial and you go, oh, my God, I I, I did the trademark search for that brand. And so it's just it's it's kind of fun. Right. Um, or, you know, you you see someone wearing a T-shirt out and you're like, well, I, I, I worked on that. It's just, you know, I think people are drawn to it because it's 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 really fun. But I, th I think the, the federal aspect of it is really appealing because you are able to be much more mobile and especially yes. with what's going on right now with the pandemic. You're able yeah. to be virtual. So it sounds to me like that is a very big selling feature. And I like that point about you choosing which industries that you want to be involved in. So just because you go into this area doesn't mean that you have to do trademark for a particular, for all the industries. You can pick your niche, as it were. 
And a lot of people do that. I mean, there, there, are, there are many attorneys who choose to focus on a particular industry, um, you know, and, you know, a lot of people have had to pivot that because of the pandemic. But, you know, I know, I know a woman who really focuses on the event planning space, you know, I know other people who focus on cannabis, um, you know, other people who focus on, you know, different industries. So, I mean, really, the, the sky's the limit. And, and, and you're right with the virtual aspect of it. All filings at the USPTO are done electronically. There are no paper filings. Um, and so it's a very easy practice to do if you're if you're a, a, a young a young parent, um, you know, you have young children, um, the PTO is sort of always open right there are certain federal holidays, but um, if there's a due date technically that due date extends until midnight. So as long as your clients don't mind, I mean, you can file something at 5 p.m. So if if you're married and, you know, your spouse is working and, you know, you have to juggle kids, especially now with, uh, you know, children learning from home and, and doing school online, there's a lot of flexibility with uh, with a trademark practice. So I think people are drawn to it for all of those reasons, including the substance of it. There, there's just a tremendous flexibility with with a trademark practice. So let's talk about the course that you've developed to be able to get people to move confidently and comfortably into this practice area. Because when we were first talking, you were telling us about how that was a big concern to you in your career and as it went through it. And it was also a big concern for me in my career that as you go through it, you realize that there's certain types of education lacking. So You've put together this course. Tell us a little bit about how that all came to be and, and what you think is the, the, what distinguishes this course from something else that's out there. Yeah. So look, I think law schools are realizing more and more that they have to do more practical education. Um, and I don't think that that's solely the responsibility of law schools. I do think we need more of an apprenticeship type um, uh, add on to law school, much like um, you all do in Canada with with articling. I think that that's an important aspect of legal education, but no, no coursework, no practical training works without the foundation of of um, case law that you learn in law school. My course doesn't work if you don't know the basics of, of case law, right? It just can't. Where, I think where that's I think, a given. I think that's yeah. a given. Absolutely, right? So th this is not a substitute, right? It's it's an add-on. Where I think I think a course like trademark abilities is is really helpful is that it 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 is like a very brief apprenticeship in that we we offer a very comprehensive um course that even a CLE can't can't provide because it's really a hands-on behind the scenes look at the entire what we call trademark prosecution process and what that means is the entire trademark application process at the USPTO but we take a step back and we start with counseling the client even on choosing the mark what we call trademark counseling um, so we, so it sounds we like it's, it sounds like that you've taken it out of the realm of just the law and we're talking about client management. We're talking yes. about the whole practice. So it's yes. not something where you're left to kind of guess about this section of what you're trying to learn. Often when you're learning an area of law, they just give you the, the goods on the law and how to do this or how to do that. This course sounds like it's way beyond that. It is way beyond that. I mean, when, when you practice before the USPTO, everything is grounded in the rules. Um, at the USPTO, we have a very voluminous rule book. So I, 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 give, I give the, um, the attorneys all of those pertinent rules, what they mean, how to navigate them, how to push the envelope on them. Look, this is not about doing anything unethical. They are rules, but it's important to know how to get around them to achieve your client's desire, right? Sounds I invaluable. A, that's that's right. the I don't kind of knowledge get, you, you can't get unless you talk to somebody who's been practicing in this area right. for years. This is not about breaking rules, right? Again, this is not about ethical violations. It's about understanding where the line is with the rule, right? Because, you know, again, right. I had a, an amazing partner at my first firm, which I think it's really important, especially for lawyers who practice in big law to understand 
who, you know, we would have like monthly lunch and learns and he would say, look, we are paid far too much money to ever tell a client no. And I was very new when I joined that meeting and I thought he understands how business works because he's right. You know, clients, when you're in a corporate transactional position of any kind as an attorney, clients don't come to you for legal advice. They come to you to solve a business issue. And I cover this in the very first few moments of the course. Our clients come to us for a business issue. They're asking us for a legal solution, but this is, we, we don't write memos. We don't write dissertations. We are using our legal minds and maneuvering to help them accomplish what it is they want. It's not our job to tell them no. That's right. so their you focus, decision. So you focus on this throughout the course. This is the client aspect. Constantly. And- and keeping the client happy and yes. knowing what the client needs and making sure that that's achieved is a big yes. part of what's integrated into this process. Yes, and it, it's a huge part of who I am because nothing irks me more than when I see an appeal or something filed at the USPTO. It might be a very interesting legal question, um, but I can always tell when someone is really just churning the file for billing Um, The client doesn't want that. The client wants and needs their trademark. It's an incredibly valuable asset. And I promise you, even though maybe you will make less money helping the client to get that registration quicker, they will be happier. They will think of you the next time they have another trademark and they will because all businesses, most of them, 99% of them have more than one if they're growing and they will refer you to other people. If you drag out the process and add unnecessary costs to the process for them that they don't understand because you see an interesting academic issue, they're gonna be angry and frustrated. They need their trademark and that's what they want and that's why they came to you. Now, so I just wanna add, I bring up an important point about this course that you are offering and that is it saves people a ton of time, energy and money and the potential of also running into difficulties because they have got such a comprehensive overview of what to do, how to do it, the forms to use, when to use those, when to, when to step back, when to step in all those different insights, inside information that you provide. So what we're talking about here is a vast return on the investment in order to get yourself up and running at the end of doing your course, a person will be able to go out and practice confidently in this yeah. area. No, that, that, that's, that's absolutely true. So I've, I've assembled all of my client communication templates. Um, you know, I, efficiency is key in this area. Um, it, like many practice areas, there can be a, a, a little bit of a, of a race in terms of consumers always shopping price. Um, This is not a a course that necessarily teaches you how to, you know, price your practice. I'm more than happy to have those discussions offline with anyone who wants to have those discussions, but that's not my decision to tell anyone how to price their services. That's a personal decision for everyone to figure out in their own market. But um, efficiency is key in this area, and we do so many things over and over again in the trademark application space that having these types of um, client communication templates and not having to, you know, have, you know, angst over what am I going to say? How do I say it? We do things over and over again. So having these templates, more than happy to share those and even substantive templates for, for key issues that tend to come up over and over again. I've shared many of mine, anything that can help people understand the types of, of, of arguments that have been successful. Now their facts may be different, but again, just to, to help them. But we, we discuss a lot of strategy, a lot of ways to analyze those issues. Um, so it's, it's rules, it's practical tips and strategies. And then, you know, there's more than 30, 30 templates. Um, in, the, in the course that can be, you know, lifted verbatim. A lot of them can be adapted for their particular situation. There's a members only discussion group. There's access to me. The course is on demand. So everyone can, 
can go through it at their own pace and everyone is at different phases of the course. And then we have these monthly, what I call ask me anything live um, chats so that wherever you are in the course, if you have a question about anything, but you know, most people just email me if they, if they're stuck. So they have a ton of valuable resources. They have access to you. They have the ability to come out at the end and be able to practice in this area. It's a federal yeah. area as we talked about. So you can set up a virtual practice and you can have clients in a number of different industries. You can specialize, right. you can niche down or you can stay in a more broader area, but yeah. you have a ton of different, of uh, you know, basically options if you go into this field. Right. And I'm just, I, I really wanted to do this video uh, with you, Stacey, because I just can't believe that this is in existence. To me, it's such an amazing opportunity for lawyers to be able to up the level of how they practice in this area without a lot of grief. Like so much of what we do in law, we take, you know, years to become an expert. And, you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, moments when you you realize that maybe you didn't quite get something right or you, you, you know, did you do this the best way? So this course is allowing people to go through the whole bottom line foundation and then build on it without that kind of angst and grief that we can so often feel. I just want to ask you a little bit about some of your stories in terms of like what has happened? What have you noticed in, in terms of people not practicing appropriately in this area, some of the things that have come to your attention that cause you concern and what you think this course would do to prevent that. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I, you know, I, I, I watch the register. I read, I read cases. It's really easy for me to see just from reading a, a decision, whether someone was an experienced um, IP attorney and, and more specifically a trademark attorney or not. But some, some of, some of the more interesting things that I've seen, just, you know, quick examples. Um, I, I had a client last year that, that came to me um, and they were, they were frustrated. Their application had already been filed and they were, you know, using their, their mark on their website. And they just didn't understand that there was a difference between what was filed and, and what was applied for. And the analogy is this, right? So trademark abilities is my brand for my legal education company. Um, and let's say my entity were trademark abilities, LLC. It's not, I have a different entity name, but let's say that were the entity. So it would be the equivalent of if, if, a, if an attorney, a, a corporate attorney, let's say, or an, a different transactional um, attorney filed my trademark application for trademark abilities, LLC, as my application, as I was getting up and running, because you're allowed to file applications on an, what's, what we call an intent to use basis. And then when I developed my website and my branding, I just wanted to use trademark abilities because that's the brand. Well, the specimens, what we call the evidence of use, the specimens wouldn't match what was in the trademark application. And so my specimens would be denied unless and until I changed my use to trademark abilities LLC. And so that's very frustrating for business owners because some really don't understand the difference between their entity and their brand. And they maybe would just change it and be like, okay, I'll just use trademark abilities LLC. But for people who really understand marketing, they'd be like, well, why would I make my brand trademark abilities LLC? That's my entity. So that may seem like a little thing, but actually that's money just thrown out the window because a whole new application would have to be filed to protect the brand because you can't change the mark once it's filed, except under very limited circumstances. Of course, there's exceptions for everything, but that's not one where you, you can change it. So putting things like ink and LLC and company and those things in the mark, they shouldn't be there because that's, that's not the brand. And that's and something that people just may not know. What about some of the, one of the things that we did talk about before was how trademarks can exist for a very long time. Yeah. So you don't want to be messing this up. It's kind of like a will that you wrote when you were first out and all of a sudden the person is, uh, you know, it's going into probate and you realize, wow, <laughs> I've learned right. a little bit in the meantime. So when you start out, you don't want to be making those mistakes because this this can exist forever. Like we were speaking about Coca-Cola, some of the other ones, yeah. they've been around for a very long time. 
Yeah, so so it's a really good point, and it's a, it's an interesting issue to manage, especially for in-house attorneys. Um, and so Coca-Cola has been in existence, especially like the famous Coca-Cola script, um, which also the the stylization of the script is a registered trademark. If anyone is a if you're a golfer, if anyone listening is a golfer, the Titleist trademark. I used to work on that portfolio. The script of the Titleist is also a registered trademark. And so Coca-Cola, as an example, has been um, in existence. That's been a registered trademark since the late 1880s. And so what's important is, again, you just heard me say trademarks um, have to be used exactly as they're filed for. That Coca-Cola script hasn't changed in 140 years. Um, essentially. And so the challenge for brand managers is they really have to be stewards of the brand and they have to work in close connection with legal counsel to make sure legal counsel has to make sure they're advising the brand managers of what the rules are. And so it, it, it is a very interesting area because of, of the longevity of trademarks. They're the only branch of IP that, that has no term, essentially. We do have to renew marks on a regular basis, but they can last forever as long as they're used. So th our job is really important. It really can't be underscored, uh, underscored enough. And this is a very detail-oriented area. If you don't like details, if you don't like crossing I's and dotting T's, it may not be for you. I mean, you can certainly hire someone, right? I mean, paralegal once you scale is, is, a, is a very important function in this area. But if, if you're not a detail person, it, it probably isn't for you because this is a very nuanced area and the details matter, right? We're talking about adding LLC versus not adding LLC. Some people may be like, seriously, like who cares? Well, it's important here. Yes, I see that. So I, I just want to really thank you, Stacy, for coming on today on Her Legal Global. And I understand that with trademark abilities, the course has a promotion on at this point. Yes. Yes. So please, um, I, I encourage anyone, anyone listening to please um, visit our website. It's trademarkabilities.com. You can learn um, more information about us there. Um, we have a LinkedIn page. Please follow us there for updates. We're also new to Instagram, so we would love for you to follow us there. And if anyone is interested in the course, we have small snippets of our educational videos on our website. So please check those out. They're between two and five minutes long. And if any of you are interested in taking the course um, for the next week, we are offering a 10% discount off the price of our course. And that coupon code is T-M-A-F-A-M-10. So T-M-A-F-A-M-10. So, um, and you can find all the details on our website on how to sign up. So I, I thank you so much, Faye, really for this opportunity. I, I appreciate it so much. It's, it's been amazing. And I think it's an incredible course. Uh, I'd love to have been able to check it out for myself. I also understand that you're in the process of developing another course, which will not this what we've been talking about today is related to US attorneys. And you are looking at a different area. Just can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's true. So the master classes for US attorneys, paralegals, patent agents, and third year legal, uh, th third year legal students uh, who are getting ready to enter the market, JDs waiting for their bar results, that type of thing, right? right. People who, who will be eligible to practice in the US. Foreign attorneys are a little bit different, right? They're not eligible to practice in the US. So the course is just, it has way too much information for them, but it's important that they understand many of the issues that they will face so that they can effectively advise their clients and work better with their US counsel partners. So I am working on a, a two hour course for them to give them an intro to the common law system, how it differs from most civil law systems and some of the pitfalls that they need to look out for. So um, please watch for that. If you'd be interested in that, please let me know, drop me a note either on LinkedIn or through the website. I hope to have that ready in March, fingers crossed, but when it is ready, I will certainly let everyone know. 
And we're also working on an introductory course as well at a lower price point, probably a, a, a two hour course as well. So those are in the works this year. Last year, I just had to get the darn thing up. So uh, this year, hopefully we'll have more time to develop some, some new offerings. Great.